Okay, so to this morning is just going to be practice on drawing MO diagrams, and we're going to do two of them, but <coughs> really large and going into detail on all of the drawings and the different symmetry labels and, and everything. So I want to start with the more complicated one, and then we'll back up and do one that's uh, more relevant to the exam. Okay, but let's stick with me on this one. I want to complete what we were doing with ammonia last time. And I want to go ahead and draw the MO diagram of ammonia to show that you don't have to do MO diagrams with diatomics. It's, they're easiest with diatomics, but you can do MO diagrams with larger molecules. So let's do the ammonia MO diagram. The last time we had uh, used the projection operator to generate the symmetry adapted linear combinations of the hydrogen atoms. And so on one side of the MO diagram for ammonia will be just those three hydrogen atoms. So let's do that on this side. So we'll do just the H, not N, H, H3 part of NH3. And over here will be the N part. And when we combine those, those three hydrogen orbitals, uh, we came in with three atomic orbitals, and we made three symmetry-adapted linear combinations. So the number of orbitals is conserved. So down at the bottom, we had one with no nodes. And that was the three hydrogen atoms all in phase with each other, so the same color. So I'm going to draw a little picture like that with all three of the hydrogens the same color. <laughs> and in the C3V character table, that was an A1 level. <clears throat> and then up here we had two degenerate or equally equal energy uh, symmetry adapted linear combinations of atomic orbitals. And those were the uh, ones where the that 1s orbital on atom A was used twice, if you will. It was twice as big, had a coefficient of 2, and it was subtracting the 1s on atom B and the 1s on atom C. And so we had a big one on atom A, so we'll call this one A. So, so this one was big like that, and then these two combined, I'll just draw two small circles and shade them in. Now, if we draw our coordinate system with x, y, and z up here, you see that that one changes sign along the y-axis. And so that's going to be the y symmetry. So when I say label these drawings, and that's going to be one of the parts of the written part of the exam, when you draw your pictures, I want you also to label the Millikan symmetry and the Cartesian symmetry. So this has Y Cartesian symmetry. The <coughs> positive side of Y is a different sign than, than the negative side of Y. It's like in this orbital. So along the Y axis, it changes sign. Okay. So this one would be Y. And then the X version of that, since we use the, the 1S on atom A tw twice in this molecular orbital or, or symmetry adapted linear combination, we're going to use it zero times in the other one. And so then we have this picture on this side where this ball and the one in the back are different colors. And so now in the x direction, the front 1s orbital is a different sign than the back 1s orbital. And so that one's going to be x. And if you look in that character table, the x and the y are in parentheses on that row of E. They're degenerate in energy, and they form a basis set. x and y are indistinguishable. So those would be E symmetry. So that's the taking three hydrogen atoms in the ammonia molecule, that's how we combine them to make the symmetry adapted linear combinations of those three orbitals. We came in three atomic orbitals, we have three now adapted combinations. And then this is going to be the left side of our MO diagram. Now we're going to do the, the right side, the nitrogen atomic orbitals. That should be review. Okay. So down here close to the A1, I don't know if it's the same energy or lower. Um, Probably a little lower since nitrogen has so many protons in the nucleus, it's going to really drag those, those orbitals down in energy because they have electrons in them and they're going to want to get closer to that nucleus to reduce their energy. So down here, a little bit below 
the other side will have a, an orbital, and that's the 2s atomic orbital. Where's the 1s? Somewhere in the basement, right? So it doesn't participate in bonding. It's a core uh, shell, and so it's filled. It's close to the nucleus. It doesn't participate. This is all just valence electrons that are doing the bonding. And then up here, maybe a little bit lower than, than the hydrogen atoms, we'll do the triply degenerate 2p orbitals. And those would be x, y, and z. And now we combine things. Well, but first we, let's look at the different symmetries. Remember, x and y combine to form a basis of E. And the 2pz would be A1. And the 2s, the s orbitals are top row. They're, they're spherically um, symmetric. And so this one is going to be A1. So we have the symmetries of all the different orbitals that are going to mix together. And the A1s mix with the A1s. And the E's mix with the E's. And so we come in, let's do the A1s first. So we have three A1s. We're going to have three molecular orbitals that are A1. So we'll draw one way down here at the bottom, one kind of in the middle, and one at the top. Now, is that very accurate? Well, it's accurate enough to do this by hand, right? If you wanted accurate uh, orbital energies, then you would need to do a calculation like a Gaussian calculation. But how do I know if I have enough in here? Why don't I draw a fourth one? Right, I'm just mixing the PZ, the 2S, and this A1 combination. So I come in with three orbitals, I make three orbitals. Okay. And so that's, that's pretty straightforward. Um, let's mix the E's as well. So they come in and they can add together or be out of phase, so they're going to be in, you know, splitting apart. Two are going to drop and two are going to go up higher. So I'll draw two E's here and two E's here. So I came in with, let's see, four, five, six, seven symmetry adapted linear combinations, and I should have seven molecular orbitals. One, let's just number them. One, I'm going to put these in circles. Two, three, four, five, six, and seven. So those are my seven molecular orbitals. These numbers will be useful later because I'm going to come over here and probably draw the pictures for them. Okay. Let's label the symmetries. We mix the A1s together, and so these would be A1. And then we'd mix the E's together, so this would be E. We could draw these little lines, but it just makes it really busy. Right? Maybe something on the test. Don't draw the um, no, not really. I mean, just make sure there's enough spacing so I tell where the MOs are versus the atomic orbitals. Okay. Um, it's nice to kind of see that you're mixing A1s to A1s to get the A1s. Okay. But, and then the E's, we also have these dashes here. Okay. So those. That's more of a traditional view of the molecular orbital diagram. Now let's put electrons in our atoms and in our combinations over here. So the nitrogen has how many valence electrons? Five. Yeah, yeah. so we go one, two, three, four, five. You see how I did that? They unpair first, and then they start pairing up. So I have three unpaired electrons in the P-shell. I would check that. If you just pair them up and do the one, that's not the lowest energy combination. Now over here... We have three hydrogen atoms come in with uh, 1s orbitals. We have three electrons. So one, two, three. And so we have five, six, seven, eight electrons. Is that right? Yeah. So then we add them up from the bottom. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So now we can answer some questions. Uh, where's the highest occupied molecular orbital? Let's label that. Four. It's this one right here, three and four, yeah. So this is the, 
the highest occupied molecular orbital. They have the same energy, so there's four electrons and two orbitals. And then this up here, five and six, LUMO. <clears throat> Let's do a side calculation. Let's go over here to the side. And looking at that MO diagram, what's the spin of ammonia, the net spin? Remember, these all cancel out if they're paired up. So since there are no unpaired electrons, the spin is zero. So spin equals zero. So multiplicity. equals 2s plus 1 is equal to 1, singlet. So this is a singlet molecule. Since all the electrons are paired, we have a zero net spin. Then 2s plus 1 is our multiplicity. All the spins are paired, so it's a, it's a singlet molecule. Okay. We could also do the the transition, or we should do the, we could do the selection rules of E to E. We'll do that later. Let's draw the pictures for all these in the middle first, though. I'll try. Hmm. You've got this in your notes, right? And so let's just go over here and we'll list all the pictures for these. Okay, I think that'll probably be the best way to do it. So down here for, for number one, let's, let's try to write out what atomic elements are used in number one, okay, or atomic orbitals. So if I were to write this out, it would be the 2s. Well, let's draw the picture first, and then you'll see what I'm trying to talk about. So we have N, H, H, H. Everything's in phase, and so it's just one color, the whole thing. So the 2s is in the same phase with the 1s's, and they all change red or green at the same time. Okay. Let's think about this, though. If, if all three of these hydrogens over here are the same color as the bottom of the 2pz, then we'd have a node right at the nitrogen. So we could draw the 2pz on the nitrogen in phase with those three 1s. So number two would be right here. The nitrogen and the three hydrogens. Let's draw the, the, the pz orbital. And now the bottom is in phase with the three hydrogens. How's that? Okay. So that would be 2pz plus the 1sa plus 1sb plus 1sc. Okay. Let's jump up to number seven. And do that one. So this would be the 2PZ that's out of phase with those hydrogens. So what kind of colors would I have here? Well, notice the greens on top and the reds on bottom for this 2PZ orbital. And up here, we could just swap the colors and make the bottom green. <coughs> and then the top would be red, and these hydrogens would be red.
and think about the nodes. Remember, curvature is related to energy in these wave functions. This one has no nodes. This one has one node right there. This one still has that node there, but then it's got some nodes inside the molecule. Very complicated looking node. It's not as easy as a plane. In many of the molecules, like the diatomics, the nodes are all planes. Maybe there's a cone, but this one is kind of a strange shape where this node's in the middle of the molecule. But if you think about all of these orbitals, it's really just plus and minus combinations. So like this one here is just the, the uh, 2s on the nitrogen plus 1sA plus 1sB plus 1sC. You see that? You could write that out in sort of a shorthand, and that would represent that image. Right here now we have the 2pz on the nitrogen. And you see you've got all these pluses here. What, up here you've got the 2pz minus all of those. So if you've got a plus and minus combination, this would be the 2pz minus 1sA minus 1sB, minus 1sC. <clears throat> Does it make sense? This little handwritten, you know, shorthand is something I'd like for you to know. I'd like for you to be able to look at this picture and see that that's the 2PZ plus 1SA, 1SB, 1SC. If there's a node. If there's no node, then it's the 2s. Okay? You're looking at this one, you know that that's the 2s because there are no nodes. The 2p has to have a node. All right, let's try to draw the other four. Okay, number three is going to be that uh, hydrogen on the left is really big, and the two hydrogens on the right are, are kind of small. So we have this big one over here, and these smaller ones over here. And they're different colors. So let's make green on the left, and red on the right. And this is going to be the lower energy one. So which is this going to mix with? Which p orbital on the nitrogen? Look at this Cartesian symmetry over here. <clears throat> See right there? This is the Cartesian symmetry y, y-axis. So it's going to mix with the 2py. Okay. And so I'm going to draw that 2PY on here. And this is the lower energy one. So do you think which the colors are going to be? The green on the 2PY is going to be on the left to interact with the hydrogen. So that's the 2PY interaction in a bonding manner. What do you think number five looks like? It's just the 2PY switched so that they're out of phase. So I'm going to go ahead and draw that one really quickly. This is going to be number five up here. It's kind of cramped, and that's fine because, again, it's got a lot of curvature. And that means it's higher in energy. The more nodes, the more energy. So it's that same molecule with the same Y combination of the hydrogen atoms, but now the 2PY is out of phase with that. And so if you were to label this one down here, 2PY plus uh, 
a 2 times the 1SA minus a 1SB minus 1SC. So remember, that's that combination for the hydrogens. And I have the 2PY plus that combination. What do you think this one up here is going to be? I mean, the same shorthand, 2PY on the nitrogen minus 2 times the 1SA plus 1SB plus 1SC. So it's just plus and minus combinations gives you the jump in energy, a drop and a, an increase in energy. Let's draw orbital number four. And here we have the px orbital on the nitrogen interacting with those two hydrogens. These kind of come in and out of the board, so it's difficult to draw. But this is a hydrogen that's coming out front, and so this is the lobe of that 2px orbital coming out to the front. And it's in phase with that hydrogen. And this is the hydrogen that goes back into the board, and that's the lobe of the 2px orbital that goes back into the board. And so they're interacting as well. So we still just have one node. We've got a larger box, if you will. The electron doesn't have to stay on the hydrogen atoms. It can go on to the nitrogen and interact with that px orbital. So what's happening with the hydrogen right there? Uh, this one? No, because it was used twice in this one. So the, the number, essentially the total number of, uh, of uses of the orbital is conserved as well. So if we use that, that hydrogen with a coefficient of 2 here, then it's used 0 here. This has a coefficient of 1 for the SB and 1 from up here for the, for the 1SB. So, and you will see this in threefold symmetry with every molecule. It's how we combine three things to make two things. We use one of those three things twice in one of the combinations and zero in the other. Even in a methyl stretch, so when we're talking about stretching, when we have the stretching of the CH bond in a methyl group, one of these combinations in the XY deformation will be twice the stretch on one bond while the others compress and then the other combination will be no stretch on that bond while the others are out of phase with each other. So this is the way you combine three-fold symmetry into a two-fold system like XY. So you've got to get three things to behave in just an XY coordinate and one way is for it to deform twice as much in the X and zero in the Y. Difficult really to find words to describe that. It shows up very easily mathematically. And so that's why I'm trying to draw out these little shorthands. So then we have uh, the 2px uh, plus 1sb minus 1sc. So this is the 1sb minus 1sc, and then we're just adding in that 2px. And then up here, number 6. <coughs> So again, we're not using that 1s on atom A. We've got these here and the p orbitals, and we're just going to draw them out of phase. So this was red up front, and now that px orbital is red in the back and green in the front. So now we have a node that weakens those bonds. Because again, if that node goes across the bonds, then those bonds are weakened by this orbital. If we were to put electrons in this orbital, then those bonds would get weaker. But as you see from our MO diagram, there are no electrons in those bonds, in those orbitals. This one is going to be labeled, we just switch the signs on, on this one. So it'll be a minus 1sb and a plus 1sc. So it'll be 2px minus 1sb plus 1sc. And so those are the seven pictures. Hopefully you could do that, right? You're just taking the atomic orbitals and combining them. First, you combine the hydrogen atomic orbitals to make symmetry-adapted linear combinations, the A1 and the E pair. 
and then you're combining those with the atomic orbitals on the nitrogen. And you just match the colors for the bonding or the lower energy ones, and you, you put the colors in conflict for the ones that are higher in energy. Now hopefully this is sort of helping you understand how these orbitals go together. So we can do some of this sort of mentally with, you know, by hand. Um, and then when you look at the Gaussian pictures, you'll be able to kind of see what you would have drawn by hand in those pictures. It's just a little different shape because the Gaussian goes ahead and, and optimizes the, the positions of those orbitals. What's left to do? Let me look at my notes. Okay. Let's look at this MO diagram now. I want to ask you a trick question. What's the bond order? Uh, bond has bond order of one. Well, if we're looking at the pictures, we see like non-bonding here for the for this hydrogen nitrogen bond, but or just to do this one. You know, non-bonding for that hydrogen, but bonding for these NH bonds. Um, this is bonding for all three. Um, this is bonding for all three. This is anti-bonding. Of course, it's not populated. This is bonding for all three. So it looks like all of these are star, are sigmas, you know, of some sort. Okay, but really, there's there's really no way to label these as sigma star, pi star, or whatever. So bond order really works well with diatomic molecules. And so when you get to something like this, you know, this looks like it has four bonds, but I look at ammonia, I only see three. <clears throat> so that's a problem, isn't it? So then you got to decide if you twist my arm and make me um, choose something, I'd have to find one of these that was more non-bonding than, than the others. But all of them have electron density between the nuclei. And if they have electron density between the nuclei, that's a bonding interaction. It supports the bonding. And so really just focus on bond order being relevant for diatomic molecules. Okay. And also focus on sigma and pi star being uh, really just relevant when you have clear pi clouds like in benzene. We don't really talk about the sigma framework, do we? We just really talk about pi cloud. Those are those unused PZ orbitals. And those are easy to talk about in bonding and anti-bonding arrangements, uh, pi and pi star. But as far as the sigma, we don't get into the molecular orbitals that make up the sigma framework because it's much more complicated. It's more like this. So we do have pi and pi star interactions, especially in double bonds and inter aromatic uh, clouds and, and organic molecules. But trying to take this molecular orbital diagram and force it into the box that we created the diatomics in, it doesn't really fit in that box. Okay. Reactions, things that you want me to clarify? Yes? How would you set up the homologous transitions? Okay, yes, the symmetry, yes. Let's do that real quick. The, Let's do the selection rules for this molecule, just for that homo to lumo transition. I hate to erase these beautiful pictures, but gotta be. All right, so. Selection rules. <coughs> So we set up this transition dipole moment because we know the intensity will be uh, equal to this integral squared. Now remember direct notation, this is an integral over all space, and we can determine if that's going to be zero or non-zero if that integral um, resulted. We can determine if we know the symmetry if that integral is going to be zero or non-zero. If it's zero, then the, the transition is forbidden. If it's non-zero, then it's allowed. We won't know exactly how intense it is. We'd have to actually do the math for that but we can at least tell what kind of light might be allowed to make this transition. So the HOMO is E and the LUMO is E. You see that from the, uh, 
the MO diagram, the symmetry of the HOMO and the symmetry of the LUMO. And then we've used the direct product table in, uh, in the C3B character table to do this. So we have two E's, and then we need to check to see if X, Y light, or Z light is, is uh, allowed. Now, X, Y light is E, and Z is A1. So we have two problems to do. Which one do you want to do first? Okay, so let's do E, A1, E. So we look in the direct product ta table, but we can also know that A1 times anything just returns that thing. So this A1 times E will just return E. So we've reduced the, the, the integral by 1. Now we have 2E. So E times E is A1 plus A2 plus E. So this, this integral contains three terms, and these are the symmetries of those three terms. So we see this A1 here, and if the integral result contains A1, then that's not equal to zero. So therefore, this is not equal to, not equal to zero, therefore um, Z polarized light So Z polarized light could make that transition. So ammonia with light oscillating in the Z direction along the, the axis of the molecule could cause this homo to lumo transition. <laughs> along those same lines, if we use X, Y light, we have E times E times E. So this gives us A1 plus A2 plus E as a set. And now we have E times all of those. And so it just multiplies through. So E times A1 is going to be E. Pardon? Okay, E times A2 is going to be E, and then E times E is A1 plus A2 plus E. So let me just go ahead and draw those out. So E times A1 gives E. E times A2 gives E. And these are all added together. And then E times E gives A1 plus A2 plus E. So that's a lot of terms in this integral but we see A1 in there. And so this integral contains a term that has A1 symmetry. Therefore, it's not equal to zero, and therefore X or Y polarized light is allowed. So it can come in and, and oscillate in the X or Y direction and interact with that highest occupied molecular orbital and can cause this transition to occur. Okay. <clears throat> that was a good question. Okay, let's do let's do one more. Okay. <clears throat> a strange one. Let's do aluminum nitride. Okay. 
okay? It's diatomic, <laughs> right? Why not? So on this side, we have aluminum. Over here, we have nitrogen. We have aluminum nitride in the middle. <clears throat> I'm drawing my coordinate system here with Z along the horizontal axis because that's my diatomic here. Let's draw the nitrogen 2p orbitals and the 2s orbital. And then aluminum, I don't know, you think that would be lower or higher? I mean, it's a, it's a higher, it's a bigger element, it's more protons, but it's, it's farther to the left in the periodic table. It's only got, in its valence shell, three electrons, okay, so, yeah, I know, exactly. You have to look at the atomic radii, and here's kind of a toss-up, you know, that from my memory, I wouldn't be able to say, okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead, since it's further left than aluminum, just like boron will be a little higher than aluminum, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it just slightly higher, okay? So, but what do I label these p orbitals? What's their quantum numbers? 3p. Um, yes, 3p. Okay, and that's something that is easy to screw up. Higher or lower, I'm not going to count off if, it's a little, if you get that wrong necessarily, unless they're on the same row. If they're on the same row, it's clear. If I was doing boron nitrogen, okay, boron would be higher. Nitrogen, more protons would pull those those orbitals down. Okay, so three, this is three p and three s. X, y axis. Let's put the valence electrons in these atoms, atomic orbitals. One, two, three, four, five for a for nitrogen. One, two, three for aluminum. <clears throat> Let's make our combinations. So the 2s and the 3s bonding and antibonding. We've got nitrogen and aluminum. Uh, SP mixing or not, I don't know, okay? I think it, the, the way we should go about in this class is that oxygen and higher don't have SP mixing. But we were talking about this in office hours. I'm not sure if that carries on to the third row, but SP mixing is in, we know it's in nitrogen and lower. Where What I mean by SP mixing is the ramifications. Is this sigma above or below the pi bond? Okay, and so that's the question. I'm gonna draw it below because it's oxygen or higher, okay? And so I'm gonna call this one the sigma, the two pi bonds are there, the pi star there, and the sigma star there. But there would be a question here, you know, these might be swapped. Mm -hmm. Let's bring in our electrons. So we have five here, six, seven, eight. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So looking at this, we see that we have what kind of uh, net spin for this molecule? This is a plus and one half, and this is plus a half. So a total spin of one, what's the multiplicity? Three, so two times one plus one is three, so it'd be a triplet molecule. Can you tell me what kind of experiment would tell me conclusively if this was correct? What if this was flipped and the pi bond was down here and the sigma was up here? What would the multiplicity of the molecule be? It'd be a singlet. Which one would be paramagnetic, this one or the other one? This one's got unpaired electrons. And so we could put this, if we could get this molecule isolated and we could put it in a magnetic field, if it was drawn into that magnetic field, we'd know this was right. 
If it didn't interact with the magnetic field at all, we would know that these two were switched. And so that's one of the ways we know if we've got the molecular orbital diagram correct or not. That's, we could also do it maybe with X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, but a magnetic experiment in this particular case would tell the difference between the sigma and the pi being swapped or not. So is that like aluminum naturally not magnetic? Could it like, would the nitrogen just... Like but see, this is the magnetic field of the electron cloud. Yeah, yeah. so there are also... Um, Ferromagnetism, where the nuclei spin, nuclear spins add up. These are this is not uh, related to the actual element. It's just related to the electron cloud. Yeah. So you could make nitrogen, uh, so electron cloud magnetic by making it nitrogen dianion. So you put two more electrons on the nitrogen molecule, and all of a sudden its electron cloud is paramagnetic. So it's just we're talking about the magnetism of the electron cloud by having unpaired spins. Remember, these little spins are like spinning charges, and spinning charges create magnets, magnetic fields. And so if we have unpaired spins, we have a tiny little magnetic field in that electron cloud, and we can detect that. Okay, so we've got the... Now we can calculate the bond order. Okay, two, four, six electrons in the bonding orbital. Six minus two over 2 is equal to 2. So we have 4 on top divided by 2, so a bond order of 2. Okay. <clears throat> what molecule is aluminum nitride isoelectronic with? So it has this electron cloud that would be similar to what other molecule? So look at the periodic table, and you see that aluminum is to the left, and nitrogen's to the right. If you move both of those one space closer to each other, that's isoelectronic. Okay, so this would be isoelectronic with silicon carbide. Yeah, so SIC that'd be the same number of electrons, and you'd end up with a similar MO diagram. It might even be isoelectronic with C2, right? Because they both would come in one in terms of their valence electrons. Mm -hmm. So you're just thinking about valence electrons. Isoelectronic is dealing with the valence electrons. What about um, if it was nitrogen molecule and I wanted to move one of those atoms two spots to the left, I could take away two electrons, right? So this would be isoelectronic with nitrogen plus two, right, N2, two plus. Because this has two less electrons than nitrogen. So it would be just like nitrogen molecule with two electrons removed, also isoelectronic. Okay. What about, uh, um, see, boron, B2, two minus. If I wanted to add two more electrons onto it, it would be isoelectronic with B2, two minus. That seems to confuse some folks. I see some faces. What about carbon monoxide? CO? Two different ones. Cool. They all increase. Yeah, they all increase. So you have the CO2 plus. <laughs> okay. So we went to the right, we had two more electrons, made CO, but then we take two electrons away and you'd get this electron code. Mm -hmm. So there's a bunch of different options for isoelectronic. It's just however many, however, whatever way you can get to, two, four, six, eight, eight electrons in the valence cloud. Anything that has eight electrons in the valence, the total number of valence electrons would be isoelectronic with this. Okay. So, I don't know. Hydrogen fluorine. Or... Yeah, something like that. With but it, but the hydrogen you'd lose the two, the p orbitals, and so that might be too much of a stretch. But you got the idea. Um, do I need to draw the pictures for these? I see. I mean, we have some time, right? Let's go ahead. I'll just draw them quickly down here at the bottom. So here, this is both uh, 
two s orbitals are in phase, out of phase. Then we have the PZ orbitals. <coughs> so we have one side that's red, another side that's red, and green in the middle. Let's do the fourth one up the fourth one up here. We have And then the, the, the atoms are in the middle here. You see those pictures? And then we can do the p orbitals. Hopefully you should be very comfortable, almost to the point of being bored with this, <laughs> right? That's a good sign. You're like, okay, I got this. Is it that easy? Yes. You need to let yourself get it. Look at the, look at the nodes. No nodes, one node, two nodes, one node sideways, two nodes, three nodes. It just gets more and more complex, much more curvature. Remember, the, the more the change is sign, that wave function is curving a lot. Just like in the particle in the box, if we were to draw a line through here and make this one dimensional, we'd have plus, minus, plus, minus. It would go up and down, up and down. All right. I think y'all are well prepared. Oops, was that a jinx? Mm -hmm. The second. Yeah.